first one we say is that the Bible is, has perspicuity. Perspicuity, which is a fancy word which means you can understand what it says when you read it. I think I got the wrong vowel there. There. Perspicuity. So in other words, if I sit down and read through the book of Mark, what I read is what, is, what it means. So Jesus walked in the water. Well, that's what it means. And Jesus fed 5,000. That's what it means. It's not like there's some sort of hidden level underneath that only a few people get and that you have to have special wisdom to be able to figure out. That's not the case. It's what it says, that's it. There's not these deep, a deeper level of meaning. Yeah. It's interesting you bring that up because I was talking to my uncle um, several weeks ago when I was moving up here and he is Baptist and he is going over a series that is tearing scripture apart to under, really understand what's going on. And, he's talking, and they were talking about Paul and how Paul, how words Paul was using meant, meant more to the people that day than they do now, meant differently. Yeah. How do you speak to that? We need to pay attention to the, to the history. We do some of that stuff. That's what you yeah. do in exegetical classes. You kind of dig in what's going on here, what's happening and why, and you try to understand what the words mean. But, you know, ultimately we also say that the basic meaning of it is pretty evident. Now, obviously, the richer you understand the text, the deeper you can go. I mean, Belts can walk through a text, and he'll pull stuff out that I'm not able to do just because he knows the Greek and the, these connections with some of these words. That's pretty cool. And does that bring even greater understanding? Yes. But does the basic gist of the, word, the idea, the message, it's pretty clear. Jesus was born. He lived. He died. That's it. Now, you also have to be careful, though. Are there parts of Scripture that are just obscure as all get out? Yes. <laughs> yes, there are. You know, Paul making his reference in 2 Corinthians, that's why we baptize for the dead. Or in 1 Corinthians 15, I mean. Oh, really? What does that mean? You know, who knows? And you start trying to figure out what that means. And you got a few, um, there's some obscure parts when you start cranking through um, Daniel and some of these other areas. You start saying, what's going on here? You know. I was just thinking about Revelation mm -hmm. because Dr. Meissner, when we covered it with him, told us that it was actually written deliberately in a kind of a code to, so that it could be smuggled, so it could be moved around without being destroyed by the people who were trying to destroy the church. At the yeah, time. but see, the code is not like you've got... It's not that complicated. It's apocalyptic literature, which puts it into a different category. So it, it is doing different things, and numbers mean things, and the symbols mean things. But see, it's not like the... Um, Readers at the time had to figure out what it was or had to be given the code book. They knew. They understood it was apocalyptic literature, and they understood it, and they could read it. We read it now, and it's a little bit op op opaque to us. But a little understanding, and that starts to become pretty clear, too. Because literal translation of that book has created a lot of rights. And you see, we're going to get to that. We don't believe in literalism. But we'll get to that in a minute. Go ahead. So is it for the example that you talked about with Paul, that the people of the time understood what he meant? Sure. Absolutely. And mostly we do too. I mean, you read Paul and he talks, he just lays things out. Yeah, okay, there it is. That's what it's supposed to be. You know, husbands love your wives. And wives be submissive to your husband. Okay, I've got that. I mean, if you don't like it, and even there in it reference is. to the baptized. The baptized the dead. Probably the people didn't knew what he meant. He was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. We're not so sure. We so we guess and try to work it out. All right. So, perspicuity of Scripture, that's the first principle that we have going into as we look at this. Remember we talked about presuppositions? Well, these are some of the presuppositions we have when we read the Bible. We believe it, is pers it has perspicuity, and we believe in the sufficiency of the Bible. But again, sufficient for what? Well, sufficient for salvation. Makes us wise into salvation. Is it going to answer every curious question I have? No. It tells me what I need to know. Tells me what I need to know to understand about God's plan. Efficacious. There's that word again. We talked about that. The efficacy of the sacraments. Well, Scripture is efficacious. It does what it's supposed to do. This is that promise from Isaiah. My word will not return to me empty, but will accomplish that for which I sent it. It's efficacious. It gets done what it's supposed to do. But the efficaciousness of Scripture 
is sometimes, you know, pointing to working salvation. Sometimes it just condemns. That's part of the message too, the law of it. And it gets that job done. So it does what it's supposed to do. It's powerful. Why? Well, the Holy Spirit is at work here. Holy Spirit's doing his thing through that, pro through that proclaimed word. He's working. And then finally, number four, along with the powerful work of the Holy Spirit, we have the principle that Scripture interprets Scripture. So the Bible helps us understand the Bible. And if one part is really obscure, we look at another part to try to shed some light on it. And we do that. <coughs> Also, we would say that while we bring these, we have others too. Christ is the center of the whole thing, that it's reliable, that it is coming up to us from God, and so we can't trust it. It is a divine, any human book. These are all presuppositions we have going in, and we admit those. We don't claim to be objective readers. We said there's no such thing. So when we read the Bible, we read it with all kinds of presuppositions, and these are among them, and they shape how we read it and how we understand it, and they also shape what happens as we read it. Um, you said we're not literalists. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between number one and literalism? Well, the first security of Scripture is just the clarity of it. That's okay. what we mean by this. In other words, it's clear enough what it's trying to say. Okay. But the perspicuity of Scripture also means that you're going to read it as it was intended to be read. And this is why we are not fundamentalists and we are not literalists. We read the Bible as it is intended to be read. You read the book of Psalms differently than you read the book of Mark. Because in Mark, when it says that Jesus walked in the water, we know when Jesus walked in the water. But in the Psalms, when it says the hills will clap their hands, we don't imagine the hills growing arms and then clapping. We know what it means. Same thing with Job. Job is full of this kind of figurative language. So the correct reading of Scripture is different than the literal meaning of Scripture, sometimes. And that also helps us with the book of Revelation. Because if you read it literally, you end up with all kinds of strange stuff. But if you read it correctly, you're reading it as apocalyptic literature, and things drop into place, and it makes a ton more sense. Well, the fourth point you made clears that up. Because most of the, um, most of the uh, things that are in there that, are, that shouldn't be taken literally the, the um, Old Testament sheds light on. <laughs> true, true. Things will get cleared up from other places, and we understand. It's all about Christ, and it's not about works righteousness, and it's not about you know secret things and all this kind of stuff that it seems like. It's a lot simpler than that. All right, so if you believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, it is helpful for understanding God's plan of salvation, and it's also helpful for training us in how to live and shedding light on our, our living. It does all of those things, so the Bible accomplishes that stuff. Sufficient, efficacious, Scripture interpreting Scripture. What keeps us from becoming fundamentalists? Why aren't we fundamentalists? Because fundamentalists believe it's all about the Bible, too. They believe in the inerrant Bible. If you start talking to some of your fundamentalist friends, you start thinking, hey, we're in agreement, we're just like you are. We're fundamentalists who have the Lord's Supper. We're fundamentalists who wear alds. And that's what makes Lutherans a Lutheran. Yeah, you're right. Because then can't the ball become like a way we can bargain with God? Like, is that how like the prayer of Jabez and stuff like that could work into it? <coughs> that, yeah, good point. It becomes, we start to manipulate Scripture for our purposes. That's one of the surprising things about a literalistic way of reading this. If I adhere to literalism, I end up being able to kind of manipulate Scripture, actually, for my purposes. Prayer of Jabez is a great example. Oh. So here you have this kind of obscure reference in the Old Testament in passing, and now some guy says, well, we're going to read this literally. Well, it says, Jabez was blessed and prospered by saying this prayer. I guess I should say the prayer, too. And you start getting all this kind of goofy stuff going on. It's almost like magic. Say the prayer, believe the prayer, as long as it'll just happen. That, that's, that's coming out of that literalism. And it fits my purposes, but is that really what's going on? No, it's a, it's a faithless reading. I'm not being faithful. The other big distinction between us and fundamentalists is really the place of Christ in all this. Fundamentalists start with the Bible and then move to Christ. We start from Christ and from our relationship with Him and then move to the Bible. 
That makes a big difference. So my faith is not founded on Scripture. My faith is founded on Christ. I know Christ through Scripture, but I also know him through the proclamation of the church, down through all the history and all the generations. And see, that's where also the tradition of the church kind of plays a part because the church also helps me to be a faithful reader. And the church teaches me, that community teaches me how I should be reading so that I don't read it in some kind of new idiosyncratic, goofy, wrong way. I'm checked by that because the church holds me in check. And so I can't just cook up some new idea and say, hey, I think this is how we should read this verse. And the church for 2,000 years has said, no, that's the wrong reading. Why, do, why am I suddenly right? I'm not. I've got to read in the context of the church, the community. All right. 